Berarir, the wife of Rabbi Meir, was well known as a fitting companion to her illustrious husband. This is the story of her amazing wisdom and goodness. One Sabbath, while the rabbi was at the yeshiva, their two brilliant young sons fell ill of a fever. And in spite of everything that the physician and the mother could do, the boys died. Beraria remained alone with her sons. Her mind echoed with grief. Gradually she came to an understanding of what she must do. It was the Sabbath day and the Lord had sent his decree about the Sabbath. She would not profane the Sabbath. She would not weep. She would not grieve. Calmly and tenderly, she lay the bodies of her sons in their own room and covered them with a white cloth. Then she went into another part of the house and changed into her Sabbath clothes and waited for her husband to return. When she heard him coming, she went out and greeted him as usual, showing no sign of grief. And as they came into the house, her husband told her some of the high points in the discussion at the yeshiva. The sun began to set. The sky grew dusky. Beraria brought forth the wine and the wine cup, the spice box and the lamp wick for the celebration of Havdalah. Pouring the wine into the wine cup, the rabbi gave the blessing that separated the Sabbath day from the rest of the working week. The Sabbath was over. Beruria set the table for the evening meal. Her husband washed his hands. Our sons, he said, have they not yet returned? You'll see them presently, she said, and turned the subject to other matters. When the evening meal was over, Beruria turned to her husband and said, Rabbi, I want to ask your advice on a very important matter. Many years ago, a merchant passed through this city and because the rest of his journey lay in a region beset by thieves and because he knew that he could trust this household, he left his two most precious gems in my care. He said that he would return one day and claim them. It was a long time ago. And my problem is that he has returned and he is claiming them. And what I want to know is, in the meantime, I have myself, of course, become very fond of these treasures. And what I want to know is, uh, do I have to return them after so long? And the rabbi looked at his wife in amazement and said, Beria, I can't believe you're asking this question. You're a woman of such understanding, of such spirit. Not only must we give these jewels back, we must give them back with joy to show that we were worthy of the honor that they were left in our care in the first place. Husband, said Beraria, that is what I wished to hear. Remember your own words and she took him by the hand into the boy's room and she pulled back the white cloth. The rabbi stared at his sons in unearthly silence. He flung himself down beside them with a terrible groan. My sons, my sons, my pride and my joy. Beraria was weeping now, but at the sight of her husband's grief, she sought to comfort him. Husband, she said, remember your own words as you yourself instructed me. The Lord gave these children into our care and 
we must give them back with joy to show that we were worthy of the honor of caring for them in the first place. Thus she soothed him with wise, tender words until he too felt the relief of tears. They obeyed the will of God and continued to live their lives with courage and patience. When I heard that the topic tonight was voices from elsewhere, I was a bit stumped. With all these wonderful international guests coming in, I wondered if Hyatt Street, Richmond, counted as elsewhere. <laughs> I guess everywhere is elsewhere to somewhere. It reminded me a bit of that bar in South Bank called Someplace Else, and how we'd always wondered, my friends and I, if they opened up a second bar, what they'd call it. <laughs> Someplace really else. And yet another place else. Voices from elsewhere. I ran through all of the predictable themes in my head. Globalization, multiculturalism, migration, nationality, ethnicity, identity. But found them all, frankly, a bit too worthy and dry to connect to. So then my girlfriend said, it's easy, voices from elsewhere, ventriloquism. <laughs> I asked her if she meant I should do a ventriloquist show, and she pointed at me and said, well, all you need is a dummy. How hard could it be? We did some research, started practicing, learned the ways to fake the F, V, B, P, and M sounds, what in the science of ventriloquism are known as labial sounds. I told her she was good at it. She told me I was not, <laughs> that I looked like Sean Penn in I Am Sam, <laughs> and sounded like Keanu Reeves in, well, like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I told her I could get used to her ventriloquizing, her lips forced always slightly ajar, but her mouth never allowed to move. That it much better suited her than me. She said, yes, you've always had difficulty producing labial sounds. <laughs> Stop picking fights with M, I wrote in my diary that night. Then I googled Sean Penn and I Am Sam and Keanu Reeves and speech impediment, and came away saddened at the cruelty of life. <laughs> thinking about ventriloquism, though, got me thinking about an event I did a while back in Paris. I started things off in the usual way, by saying something like, how, how you going? And there began a giggling in the audience, which slowly grew into widespread laughter. Needless to say, I started panicking. I wanted them to laugh, of course but not before I tried to be funny. <laughs> As it turned out, to them, I was funny. What was funny was that a voice that sounded like mine was coming out of a face that looked like mine. I was an Asian dummy with an Aussie voice. <laughs> now, this is probably latent racism, but sometimes, when I'm in a tricky situation, I think, what would Bruce Lee do? Sometimes I even tell white people he's my grandfather. <laughs> but his surname has two E's, and yours only one, they might point out. Yes, well, as you know, I would whisper, we were refugees, <laughs> boat people. We had to leave almost everything behind. <laughs> even vows.
My grandfather Bruce wouldn't have been perturbed by this Parisian crowd. And when, after the event, a genial Australian bloke whose beard totally covered his lips so that when he talked it seemed like his voice arose from a quivering bush, when he came up to me and said, no offence, and you've got to love it when strangers lead with no offence, but when you opened your mouth, he said, none of us could believe how Australian you sounded. When he said this, Bruce would have kept his cool. When you open your mouth, I said, I can't even see your mouth. <laughs> Over the years, I've thought about this bearded man, and I've come to realise he was wrong. But he was also right. He was right, for one, about my accent. There are huge gaps in my cultural upbringing. I grew up speaking only Vietnamese at home and only English outside. So I never learned how to speak English with an Asian accent. <laughs> Do you know how embarrassing it is to look like Confucius and not be able to pull off a Confucius joke? <laughs> I'm always forgetting, for example, whether you're meant to turn your R's into L's, as in little rabbit, <laughs> or your L's into R's, as in little rabbit. <laughs> Once, for complicated reasons I won't go into, a travelling companion needed me, with no notice, to pretend to her parents, who were picking us up from the airport, that I was a newly arrived Chinese exchange student. <laughs> I was too scared to try my Asian accent in English, in case the conversation steered into a discussion about little rabbits <laughs> or red roosters or some such. So I was forced into speaking Chinese. I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> I did study it for four years, but under pressure, in the car, the only Chinese that came to mind came from this very politically incorrect game we used to play where my friends and I would twist Chinese business signs and restaurant names into lewd propositions in English. <laughs> Welcome to Australia, my friend's mum said. I panicked. Ah, uh, would you like to chew my dungsi? <laughs> this actually means to go shopping in Chinese. But the only reason I remembered it was because it sounds dodgy. <laughs> My friend's mum said, I'm sorry? Uh, you like to chow yon fat? <laughs> Alice's dad turned around from the driver's seat, his face hardening. What did you say? I frantically groped through my mind for an inoffensive fragment, but what I ended up blurting out was, Or oh, you like to fa my lung gung? The fact is, to most of the world, my face is un-Australian. In most places, the question of my origin is almost always double-barrelled. Where are you from? Australia. But where are you really from? <laughs> Despite the fact this second question basically accuses you of being a liar, there's no malice in it. People still expect people to come from where it looks like they come from and are still surprised when it sounds like they don't. This works both ways. If any of the white folks in here are ever strapped for cash, remember, there's a lucrative freak show career to be made out of a Caucasian face speaking fluent Vietnamese. <laughs> Truth be told, I don't mind being a dummy. It's my job as a writer to catch and channel all those voices thrown from elsewhere. And the truth is, the bearded man, in laughing at the mismatch of my voice and face, was also being ventriloquized by his own upbringing, his own cultural conditioning. I think we could all learn something from my grandfather Bruce. <laughs> he was 32, the age I am now, when he died. And by then, he'd become a cultural icon. And he'd done it, largely, by ignoring the culture wars neither exploiting nor running away from stereotypes, neither accepting nor shying from the expectations placed on him, developing a philosophy that wanted nothing to do with labels, 
or categories or rules. He called his martial art the style of no styles. His philosophy was, quote, to use only that which works and take it from any place you can find it. And I wish now I could say it like him, heavily accented, heavily dubbed, voice thrown, and utterly unselfconscious. Twenty million people on the roads and some twenty deaths a day. It is dangerous to cross the street where I live. But I was dreaming about something else when I found myself face down under another person, saved by a few inches from the speeding wheels of a city jeep. You're fine, she said, before lifting herself up. She suggested I go to her house for a cup of tea, and still bewildered, I followed. You risked your life to save mine, I observed. In response, Uma told me the story I'm going to tell you tonight. Nina had caught a stomach bug and boarded the train from Simla back to Delhi in a stupor. Washed out and queasy, she had failed to ask for a reserved seat and was now confined to a third-class compartment. The train chugged uneventfully till Chandigarh. Are, are, hatiye! थोड़ा साइड दीजिए एडजस्ट कीजिए ना थोड़ा तो साइड दीजिए यहाँ आपके अलावा और भी लोग हैं हाँ थैंक यू जी द ब्यूकॉलिक रिदम ऑफ द नॉर्दर्न हिल्स वे शैटर्ड बाय होर्ड्स ऑफ पीपल स्लैपिंग देयर हैंड्स ऑन द ट्रेन चैसेस ट्राइंग टू फाइंड अ ग्रिप सो दे कुड होल्ड दम सेल्स इन नीना साइड शी ब्रॉट द लाइट ग्रीन चुन्नी ऑफ हर सलवार कमीज टू हर नर्ज टू एस्केप द ओडर ऑफ द थ्रॉन्ग ऑन द वंस एम टी अपर बर्थ्स now crouched whole families nina was pushed and then flattened to the window as a woman planted her buttocks on the seat meanwhile two women along with a trunk a small girl and a sack bulging with steel utensils sat down by nina's feet the train jerked forward in due course the women at her feet unpacked their utensils and served themselves rice and rasam what an idea nina thought Why not rotis? Something dry and easy. The rasam overflowed on Nina's sneakers as the older woman passed the plate to the younger. Nina offered to hold the child. The younger of the two women thanked her in broken Hindi. She was from the south, most likely, judging by the color of the rasam and the sounds of irka irka. She was all the way from Tamil Nadu. The child was passed. Rather, Nina grabbed her under the armpits and pulled her. The woman who had usurped most of Nina's seat complained, "Are yahan par jagah nahi hai? Aap kya kar rahi hain?" Nina shrugged. To prevent the child from sliding off, she clutched her with both her arms in a tight grip. "Iski kya umar hai?" Nina asked the child's age. The child was 3 but looked 2. The mother said the child was weak. The women worked in Punjab paving roads. They laid tar. and the sun turned their already dark skin blacker the child did not go to school they lived in a shack by the road and moved when the work was complete after a while the child fell asleep in nina's lap and the muted sound of conversation in the compartment gave way to the rhythmic beat of the train at the delhi railway station crowds swirled dogs sniffed for food on empty tracks flies buzzed on piles of refuse Coolies in red uniforms shouted at each other and moved with purpose. The child's mother urgently asked Nina how to find the train to Chennai. Nina spotted someone in uniform and came back with instructions. "Aap isko rakh lo. Can't you keep her?" the mother asked abruptly, pushing her daughter forward. It was so sudden, Nina choked. "She'll make a good servant. She can sweep your house," the grandmother offered. Someone had told them that the child was going to survive their fate. They hailed from a village in Nagapattinam district. You have to board your train. Your daughter is best with you, Nina said and turned away hastily. A week later, she was on a flight to Chennai. Her cargo pants filled with 30,000 rupees and a taxi waiting to drive her to the district. 
Friends had suggested finding a local school for the girl, paying the fees directly, and boarding her with relatives. Pure cash, they had warned, would probably be used up by the father to drink another bottle of Arak, or for the dowry of an older daughter. The plans were futile. The child's father was still pouring tar in the north, and the women were alone. A village elder was consulted. He was literate and knew a few words of English. Nina's driver from Chennai translated the rest. They sat in a circle on the floor. Formal adoption, the elder declared. This was not an option. Nina shook her head firmly. The elder launched into a discussion with the driver, who grew increasingly convinced and animated himself. The two women nodded their heads and hugged the girl. It had been known for generations that only one person was going to live. When she was born, the stars had shown she was the one. Nina had to take her. How else will the prophecy come true? The driver argued. The elder banged a closed fist on the floor as if for emphasis. The girl inched closer to Nina and clung to her jeans. Their logic was circular. Nina could find no way to refute it. After three days and numerous visits to the district headquarters, Uma was adopted. By now, I had finished my tea. I asked Uma if she had seen her mother and grandmother again. We went to Chennai after the tsunami in 2004. She replied, "I knew the rest. Over 5,000 people had perished in Nagapattinam district. I'm so sorry," I said. Uma believed it was meant to be. I was the tenth person she had deflected, quite literally, from death. Fifteen other people, including a young mother, had not been so lucky. You say I risked myself, but I think I fulfilled my destiny," Uma told me. I thanked Uma for her kindness and left. But when I think back to that day, I cannot help but wonder if I too should be embracing my fate like Uma.